Good evening and welcome to MDFA's first webinar of the year on OCT in macular disease, practical tips and case studies. My name is Mira and I'm an optometrist and healthcare relations manager with the MDFA. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, the MDFA acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Firstly, some housekeeping. All attendee cameras and microphones have been turned off. If you have any questions, please enter them via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but feel free to type them out at any time. The webinar today has been accredited by Optometry Australia for one clinical CPD hour. The learning objectives for the webinar can be seen on the screen now. Tonight, we are delighted to be joined by Associate Professor Alex Hanya. Alex is a retinal specialist with over 20 years experience in the treatment of macular diseases. Alex is a clinical associate professor and member of the Macular Research Group at the Save Sight Institute, University of Sydney. He is passionate about teaching and has received the Award for Excellence in Training from Ransco on five occasions. He is also involved in training overseas specialists through the Ransco International Development Program and Sight for All. Alex serves as the chair of the MDFA Medical Committee and is also a director on the MDFA board. Please welcome Associate Professor Alex Hanya. Thanks very much, Mira. Um, can you just confirm that you can see my, uh, my screen there? Yep, that's all good. Thanks, Alex. Fantastic. Um, so uh, tonight I thought I would just cover, I know that uh, OCT is always a uh, popular topic with uh, optometrists, so I just wanted to, to cover some practical tips um, and go through OCT interpretation and look at the different uh, modes and outputs that you can use with the machines and then go through uh, some examples of interpreting some, uh, some pathology. Um, so please do send questions uh, via the Q&A. I'm happy to answer them uh, later on. And, uh, and also if there are any specific questions about particular uh, slides, then I'll do my best to, to come back to those as well. Um, so one of, the, one of the topics that um, Mira asked me to mention is, uh, is what um, is useful referral information to provide uh, to ophthalmologists, particularly with regard to macular disease. Um, and I think the um, one of the important distinctions uh, from the outset is whether or not the patient actually has any symptoms or actually noticed anything. Um, because often uh, patients come in and they've had some pathology detected by their optometrist, um, and it may just have been the result of them having um, having some routine imaging done, uh, an OPDOS or an OCT or whatever. Um, and that's really quite a different situation to a patient coming in complaining of, of you know, reduced vision or distortion or whatever. Uh, it's not always easy to tell um, with some patients how long the problem's uh, been there for, um, but uh, you guys usually have the advantage, or often anyway, of having some prior information about the patient. Um, Past ocular history uh, is always helpful, although that's something that we can uh, we can get. Um, the patient's visual acuity and uh, and refraction um, is always uh, obviously helpful, and that's that's pretty much invariably in referrals. Uh, certainly, the the computer generated ones, um, and then probably the most helpful bit of information is uh, is the previous vision and refraction, um, because very often we do find ourselves getting our staff to, to call up and try to obtain that information um, in terms of patients' visual potential. So if they've got a surgical macular condition or 
um, how long ago was it that you've last seen a patient and that you know that you know they had 66 or 69 vision then and they're now 624. That's really critically uh, helpful information. Uh, and then any anything else that you can provide really is a bonus. So those those things above there, uh, particularly uh, previous vision, are really uh, super helpful. Uh, in terms of sending imaging, and increasingly uh, people are uh, they're certainly doing uh, doing it. Um, please do um, send it. Um, often, you know, the referral will say that um, that you know I've attached the. You know, this, that, and the other, and perhaps their staff haven't done it or, or whatever. But um, it is really helpful, um, particularly if there uh, may be some kind of subtle thing that you have a question about, um, particularly in the you know far periphery on a wide-angle photograph. Um, and if we've actually got uh, got that to refer to, um, then it makes uh, it makes things a lot uh, a lot easier. Um, do send the images digitally. Hard copies are, uh, are always uh, inferior, and uh, there's certainly never any point trying to fax anything. Um, I don't know if you've looked at an OCT that's been faxed, but you know what I mean. Um, so, in terms of the basics of OCT interpretation, you just have to remember really that the, the principle of it is that you're bouncing a light of a certain wavelength off the back of the eye, obviously, depending on how clear the media are. And so you need to remember what properties those different layers will have as a result of the interaction between them and the, and the light. So essentially, the plexiform layers and anything that's membranous uh, will be highly reflective, and the nuclear layers have low reflectivity. So if you just look at the uh, at the layers here, things like the vitreous and the ILM will be reflective, uh, and uh, as as is the nerve fibre layer, but then the nuclear layers, so the inner and outer nuclear layers are well seen there. They're going to be relatively hypo reflective. Uh, often you want to look very closely at the detail of the outer retina and RPE and choroid, particularly if you're looking at things like. Uh, like AMD. Uh, so the important lines to know there are the external limiting membrane, which is the first of these ones. It's that thin line there. The ellipsoid zone. So the continuity of the ellipsoid zone is generally taken as a good surrogate for health of the photoreceptors. Uh, then the interdigitation zone, which is that hyporeflective zone there. And then RPE Brooks complex, which uh, depending on the age of the patient and the quality of the scan, you can often see as a uh, as a trilaminar structure. You can't normally see Brooks membrane uh, just because it's so thin and uh, and adherent to the RPE, uh, but you can see it if the RPE is either absent or uh, or detached. Uh, and then you can see the uh, satellar layer, so the layer of the smaller vessels, halolayer, layer, which is the larger vessels and the choroidoscleral junction, which is not that well seen in a standard scan, um, much better seen uh, in an EDI or enhanced depth, depth imaging scan. Uh, so the examples I'll be showing will almost all be uh, from the Cirrus uh, machine, which I know, um, I think the OPSM stores have uh, the Cirrus, and there's a variety of other machines out there which um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not really familiar with. We've got the Cirrus and also the Heidelberg Spectralis, but this is the sort of usual workhorse for us. Um, I mean, I'm happy to field questions about the others, but I'll just go through the protocols uh, for this machine because it's um, it's just an example. Uh, really, all of these other modes will uh, really be able to be used on the other brands of machines. So. The most useful OCTs to do really break down into the high resolution cross-sectional scans uh, where we're looking to do qualitative analysis. So we're looking to look at fine details to make uh, particular diagnoses. Um, and they'll generally be either single uh, raster scans or groups of, uh, of raster scans. And they can be in a whole, uh, a whole variety of patterns. Um, and uh, and 
the you know which which ones people prefer doesn't really matter so much as um, as going through with a with a systematic approach to to analysing them. Uh, the cube scans are lower resolution um, and they're good for quantitative analysis um, and following progress. So things like thickness and volume. Um, so they're good for things like uh, macular edema um, in, uh, in diabetes and in vein obstructions and those sorts of things. Uh, so moving along. So um, this is an example of the, um, of the sort of landing page when you go into capture mode on the Cirrus. So uh, you've got a range of options there in terms of the types of scans. Um, and you can you can essentially customize it. So sorry, uh, advancing. You can customize it, uh, and you can reorder things according to preferences and the usual scans that you um, that you prefer. Um, and they're broken down into into retina and glaucoma and uh, and so forth. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what a wellness exam is, but I, I hope you've all got. Plenty of wellness there on your OCT machines. Um, so, in terms of the qualitative analysis, um, the the basic sort of building block there is the HD raster scan. Um, so, uh, on the different machines, it can be a different number of scans, um, and those parameters can be uh, can be varied as well. Um, so, this is the sort of standard HD six millimeter raster scan. Um, typically, the one that's displayed is scan three out of five, which goes straight through the centre of the fovea. Um, and you can see the other images over here. Uh, and this tracking image here um, is useful because it's, uh, it's in infrared. So if you don't have infrared imaging specifically uh, in any of your equipment, then that's a good, uh, good sort of, uh, you know, poor man's infrared camera. So this type of scan, you get good definition of the vitreous and the vitreomacular interface and the, the retinal layers. Um, you, um, it, it's always worth, if, you, if you've just uh, given a scan without a, any of the other sort of details on it, having a, a look and seeing uh, if, you can, if you can work out which eye it is. Um, and the, the main clues, if you're just looking at the scan, are that the no fiber layer uh, is always thick on the nasal side. So this is a right eye, uh, or you can just cheat and look at the orientation marker, which tells you which, uh, which eye it is. Uh, so with the standard um, HD raster um, in, this, uh, in this mode on the Cirrus, you can actually go down here and click this button to adjust rotation and size. And then this little, box will pop up and allows you to adjust and customize the rotation. You can also alter the length, that can be three, six or nine, uh, and the spacing can be either widened or narrowed. Um, and if you're looking at very focal uh, pathology, uh, for example, it, you think it may be a really, really small macular hole rather than just a edema that you can't actually visualize it, then you can drop the spacing. Uh, right down to uh, to cut through. Uh, so this is uh, on the Cirrus. There's a what's called an HD one line 100 times. So it's just got uh, oversampling uh, to give that increased definition. Um, it's also got the ability to do that scan uh, with EDI, uh, although often just the standard uh, scan gives you um, gives you what you need. And you can see that it's um, it's getting fairly close to uh, when it's good, fairly close to swept source. In that you've got really good detail there in the um, uh, in the vitreous uh, and all the way down to good choroidal uh, detail there. Uh, and this is actually an example from the uh, from the spectralis of EDI, um, and this is a, a case of pachychoroid. Uh, you can see that the coral is very thickened um, and these are the so-called pachy vessels. So those abnormally dilated uh, vessels uh, and there's really 
uh, not much in the way of uh, chlorocapillaris and smaller vessels. They're all sort of scrunched up in here. Um, you can also cover a, a larger area with raster scans using this 21 line pattern. So rather than six mil, the nine mil scans, and they cover this much larger uh, area here. Um, and they tend to be good when you're looking beyond that, uh, that very central part of the, uh, of the macula there. Sometimes you're wanting to look for uh, peripheral areas of activity in, in CNV, for example. Um, the, uh, the HD cross is not one that I uh, use often, but um, it sort of serves a, serves a, a different purpose um, and you're getting both horizontal and vertical uh, six millimeter rasters at the same time. Um, the radial uh, is quite um, is quite popular, and uh, that's a very good way of getting uh, six mil scans at all of those different um, all of those different axes, and you can just scroll down them, uh, or just click on individual ones and get the uh, get those particular angles. So, in terms of quantitative analysis, um, the um, the macular cube is really the standard sort of go to for that. Um, the, um, the false uh, color map compares with uh, age match control. So essentially uh, green, is, uh, green is good. Um, a little bit of slight um, uh, deviation from that is, is usually not of any significance. Um, and the, the figure that's, that's usually um, used in terms of the, the central foveal thickness and whether or not say diabetic macular edema is center involving is a central subfield thickness. Um, it's not particularly meaningful in patients with AMD because there's so much uh, derangement of, uh, of various layers, um, but it's certainly good in following um, patients with vascular uh, causes for, uh, for macular edema. Uh, and on the uh, Cirrus, if you click on that button there, it'll take off the uh, segmentation lines uh, and it'll just give you both a horizontal and a vertical uh, high definition cross uh, there. So it's quite a good combination of having the, the cross uh, image as well as the thickness map. Uh, and the macular change analysis uh, is helpful uh, if you're looking say at pre and post treatment. Uh, this is a patient with uh, macular edema from a vein obstruction you can see swollen disc and tortuous vessels and that's post uh, injection there. You do have to be careful though that it does register. So regardless of which machine you're using, uh, if you're comparing one visit to another, it needs to have registration. The most common reason uh, for it not registering is that the scan uh, was, wasn't of adequate quality so that the machine can't line up the, um, the retinal vasculature to, uh, to register. Uh, and you do need to be very careful of, uh, of artifacts um, on, uh, on thickness maps, particularly once you've got very swollen and abnormal retina, uh, because you're relying on the, uh, the machine and the software uh, to correctly work out where it thinks the, um, the nerve fiber layer and the, um, of the island and the RPE are. And as you can see here, it's clearly uh, incredibly swollen, and yet it's coming out and saying that the retina is extremely thin. Uh, so, in terms of what's useful to uh, to send to ophthalmologists uh, when you're referring patients, mostly for uh, specific macular diagnoses, uh, it's really uh, best to send uh, the high definition scans, the HD uh, raster type scans. Um, these ones, uh, I think this is from the, the Topcom. I, I'm assuming that, that this uh, type of scan is is because they want to try and have a sort of one size fits all um, kind of picture. Uh, the difficulty with it is that it's a um, it's a very low resolution long scan that goes well nasal to the uh, optic nerve, uh, and you've got very little useful information about the um, about the macula there. So if the question is really about something macular, then it's better to just do a specific macular scan rather than uh, rather than this one. 
Um, so you really want to be sending uh, something with decent uh, magnification that's showing the uh, pathology in question. Uh, there's just a small macular hole there. And as I said, sometimes you do need to, to narrow the uh, spacing between the scans to be able to catch something like that. Uh, and if you think there's been a change, I mean, in this case, it's a pretty obvious change. It's diabetic macular edema and the patient's had an injection, but say you've got a patient with a, <clears throat> an epiretinal membrane and you think that there's been a uh, bit of change in that uh, over time. Uh, if you send a um, sort of progress uh, scan, a macular change analysis, uh, then it gives, uh, it gives a good idea to the person you're referring to when they haven't seen them before and they're not really sure what the, what the sort of tempo of things is. Uh, so I'll just show a few examples um, that, uh, that have some uh, OCT uh, findings and, and interpretations. Um, so this lady uh, was sent in, she'd been followed for a couple of years um, with bilateral vitreo macular traction uh, and good vision, she was uh, 6.5 in both eyes and her optometrist had just been uh, following her. Um, and she'd been referred in because she'd had a two line uh, drop in her vision. Um, and the question was, is it just from increased vitreo macular traction? Now, uh, if we have a look at the other eye, so that's the left eye, which also as VMT and was pretty, I gather, pretty similar to what the right eye looked like before. Um, the, the key thing here is that VMT seldom causes a large amount of subretinal fluid like that. Um, if the traction uh, becomes really great, then it'll usually cause a lot of cystic intraretinal change and it may start to tent up and, and distort the outer retina um, but this is uh, this is highly unusual, and you've got to when you see this sort of thing. Uh, obviously, you always want to try to explain things with a single pathology. Um, but if you look here in the other eye, you can see there's quite a few drusen, and if you look here, there's a pigment epithelial detachment. Um, so this patient's got two pathologies. She's got uh, C and D from AMD as well as having vitreomacular traction. Uh, and after a single injection, uh, that fluid starts to settle down. Uh, and interestingly, you can see that as this flattens down, this becomes much more like a tabletop on there from the, uh, from the traction just holding the, uh, the sensory retina up there. And this did all eventually resolve and her vision uh, improved very nicely. Uh, and in the, uh, in the fellow eye, the uh, traction just released by itself. Uh, so this is just uh, another patient who's got recent blurred uh, central vision. Um, and the important thing here is even though this is very uh, prominent and thickened posterior hyaloid, that's vitreomacular attachment rather than vitreomacular traction. Um, and that's not the cause of the pathology that just happens to be a very broad attachment of the prominent hyaloid. Uh, this is where the action is down here. Uh, so it's uh, probably a little bit difficult to see on your screens, but there's a little uh, hemorrhage there and this grayish sort of appearance and subretinal fluid up here. Um, and uh, we'll talk about OCTA another time, but uh, the patient's got a, a neovascular membrane there. Uh, this was a patient who was uh, sent in, a bit of a vague history, but, but 618 and referred in as having uh, wet AMD. Uh, and this is kind of the, um, in contrast to the other one with the, the VMT and the second pathology of the AMD. The thing that doesn't really fit here with it being wet AMD is that there's, I mean, there is a tiny trace of, uh, of fluid there, but basically it's all intra-retinal um, and you're not seeing signs of, of AMD there. Um, so this is actually uh, cystoid macular edema um, uh, post cataract surgery. Uh, whereas this uh, here does have a lot of intra-retinal edema, but it's about the company that it keeps. So you can see 
there's these drusenoid PEDs and the subretinal fluid there and more drusenoid changes over there. Uh, this is just a, uh, a nice example showing uh, various pathologies at different layers. Uh, so this is a patient with uh, polypoidal uh, disease uh, and you can see this very peaked PED here uh, is typical of, um, of polyps. So this is really the only normal bit over here. Uh, this is the RPE here. So you can tell that this part here is subretinal hemorrhage rather than sub RPE hemorrhage because it's above the RPE. Uh, and this is, as I said, a PED there. Uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, more subretinal hemorrhage over there and a smaller uh, PED there. Uh, so this is a, um, uh, a 52 year old woman um, who's got reasonable uh, vision, but she's, uh, she's saying that she, she really can't read at all. Um, and at a first, uh, a first glance, the, the maculas don't look particularly remarkable. It's not really anything that, that jumps out there. Um, but you can see on the, uh, on the OCT scans there in both eyes, there's these funny dark spaces here and this disruption of the normal outer retinal layers here. So just looking a bit more closely at that, these dark spaces here are often described as being uh, cystoid edema, um, but in this condition, they're actually cavitations. So they're actually bits of missing retinal tissue. Uh, so it's not swelling as such. It's just that the, the retinal tissue has, um, has degenerated and disappeared. Um, and there's also these breaks in the ellipsoid layer. So if you follow the ellipsoid along here, it essentially just becomes completely jumbled and the mid and inner retina just start sort of collapsing down on top of it. Uh, I'm sure some of you already have the, uh, have the diagnosis there, um, which is uh, MACTEL, so macular telangiectasia type two. Um, so that's a, um, a bilateral uh, condition. It's very different to, to MACTEL one. Um, and it typically uh, presents in people's uh, sort of middle, middle age, although it can be a bit younger than that. And these are all different patients with, um, with MACTEL2 um, and they can have anything from not much going on to having intraretinal pigment and little crystals, uh, some little crystals here, all the way to having 360 degrees of this very unusual loss of transparency of the, um, of the retina there. Um, so these patients typically present in their 40s and 50s. Um, before we had OCT, uh, they often got uh, investigated uphill and down the dial and saw neurologists and had all sorts of imaging things done uh, or, or worse than that, people just thought they were a bit neurotic because they often had, you know, sort of 6669 and were really complaining that they couldn't read. Um, but you can see that if you've got these uh, areas of loss of ellipsoid and you can still fix off the edge of it, then you may well be able to get 6-9. Um, but if you're trying to track across uh, a page of text and you've got a big paracentral scotoma uh, in the horizontal, then you are going to have a lot of trouble reading. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the OCT uh, is, has just been absolutely invaluable in picking up these, these subtle signs. If they've only got these inner changes like these cavitations here, they usually have completely normal vision. Um, and by the time they get to things like RPE migration and crystals, there's generally quite obvious changes on the OCT scan. Um, and it, it's a little bit unfortunate that the condition is called macular telangiectasia because the telangiectasia itself is usually quite a, uh, quite a late sign clinically. Um, so it's really the um, really the OCT that's the giveaway. Um, just one more case. This is a, um, uh, well, I'd like to think that 
years old is young. Uh, she's a high myope um, and she's recently noticed some blurring and distortion, still very good vision. Um, and it's often really difficult uh, to see, particularly in this kind of eye, to see small hemorrhages. And there is uh, a little hemorrhage there next to the fovea. Um, and if you use the young, um, uh, if you use the black and white modalities that you've got, uh, if you don't have uh, autofluorescence, then you can use uh, red free, um, or you can, uh, if, if you're using the Optos, uh, for example, um, you can dial out the, uh, the red so you can go to 100% green uh, and you'll end up with this sort of picture and you can see the, uh, the hemorrhage there quite clearly. Um, and this is her OCT scan, which is, uh, which is quite remarkable. Um, first of all, uh, because she's managed to notice uh, distortion when her fovea is over here. She's very, uh, very observant. She, uh, she's an orthopter section. Um, and you can see that this is the hyper-reflective material here. That's the neovascular membrane and the hemorrhage. So that's sitting above the RPE. Um, and this is the rupture in Brooks membrane and the RPE. So you can see where it's pointing down there. And that's where the new blood vessels have grown up through the RPE into that subsensory space there uh, and cause the hemorrhage. Uh, and this is just na nowadays, um, this is from a while ago. Nowadays, I wouldn't actually do a pleurocene, I just do an OCT angiogram, which would show this very nicely. Um, but this was before we had that. So that's just the early and the late uh, stages of the fluorescent angiogram confirming that membrane. Um, and it's just an interesting sequence of OCT scans here because she just had uh, a single injection. Uh, all of this material has essentially disappeared and that line has just been reconstituted there. Um, and you can see that the ellipsoid is completely normalized over there. Uh, and she's completely asymptomatic and her vision stable. Um, and you do see uh, other causes for non-AMD uh, carotid neovascularization. So this is typically the patient who's uh, under 50. Um, and they don't have any signs of AMD, they don't have bruising and things. Uh, so you've always got to think of what the possibilities are. Um, myopia is the obvious one, but if they don't have a, a myopic fundus, uh, then there's a number of things to consider. And in this case, it's uh, it's PIC, so it's an inflammatory condition, pumped out in a chiropathy. So there's a number of these little PIC lesions here, and there's a hemorrhage here and a hemorrhage here. So there's actually two spots that the CNV is grown from. So that's the CNV there. That's subsensory fluid there. So between the RPE and the sensory retina, and that's intraretinal edema. So there's cystic edema and also some swelling here that's not, uh, not cystic in nature. So that's the end of that. I will hand back to Mira. Thank you so much, Alex, um, for sharing your knowledge and expertise and also a few tips that I think we can all apply to clinical practice. I would just like to remind you all that we do welcome your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and invite you to enter those now while I give a quick overview of how the MDFA supports patients and healthcare professionals. By referring patients with macular disease, whether they are newly diagnosed or have established disease to the MDFA, you are ensuring that they can ask those questions about their diagnosis. We provide individualized support tailored to their specific need and where they are in their journey, whether that is evidence-based education, resources, patient webinars, and information on risk management. Feedback from our macular disease community has led to MDFA creating peer support groups, where people living with macular disease can share their lived experience. We also assist patients to navigate the often complex aged care sector, as well as other government services, all at no cost. 
You can quickly refer patients to MDFA via Oculo or via our website e-referral form, and they will receive a call from our highly trained services team within three working days. MDFA is also partnering with MyInteract to provide targeted digital information to patients receiving intravitreal injections for AMD and diabetic eye disease. MyInteract is a unique and free mobile application that provides a single place for patients to view resources tailored to their diagnosis and treatment journey. We're seeking support from your practices to encourage your patients or their carers to download and sign up to MyInteract. We will provide your practice with resources containing a QR code for your patients to scan so there's no time consuming paperwork. This is a great opportunity to provide support and guidance to your patients in between their vital IVI treatment. You can email us to get involved. And finally, as healthcare professionals, MDFA are keen to support your work. So for those of you who have an interest in eye disease, you can subscribe to Macular Matters, our quarterly e-newsletter, which is a quick read and update of what is happening in the macular disease sector, as well as MDFA initiatives that may assist you or your patients. We also have free CPD accredited courses for optometrists, orthoptists, GPs and pharmacists on diabetic eye disease and AMD. In addition, we will soon be releasing a course on inherited retinal diseases. So I'm now going to invite Alex back on screen to answer some questions and I can see some have come through there. Okay. So one's come through on the chat, Alex. Um, so mm, question, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. What is the urgency of mm. referral for MACTEL type 2 and also how is it managed? Very good question. So um, really the, the uh, well, so, so the situation in which it's urgent uh, is where there's a suspicion that it's become complicated by neovascularization. That's actually quite an uncommon cause of visual loss in MACTEL. Usually in MACTEL, uh, the visual loss is due to the progressive loss of, of the outer retinal uh, layers, the, the photoreceptors uh, initially. Um, I think the, the, if, the, if the features are absolutely characteristic and it's not, there's not been a sudden change in vision, then I don't think it's desperately urgent. Um, but I think uh, there are, it can masquerade uh, as a number of things, and there are a number of things that can look like it. Uh, so unless you're, you know, very, very confident, then I'd be inclined to be sending the patient, you know, within sort of three or four weeks at the most. Um, and if there have been any sudden symptomatic changes, then definitely treat that as if there might be a uh, B, a C and B there. And in terms of the OCT imaging, um, what I showed you are the typical <laughs> changes that you'll see. Uh, you really shouldn't be seeing anything more than that. So those cavitations uh, often have, or usually have quite geometric margins to them. Uh, and the retina is not thickened. The retina is actually thinned. So it always used to be said that the retina was a dermatis in those areas. But if you do, obviously you make the diagnosis with the high definition scan. But if you do a macular thickness map, you'll see that the retina is actually thin uh, due to atrophy. Okay, uh, oh, and in terms, sorry, in terms of how it's managed, uh, unfortunately at the moment, there is no available treatment. Um, we're just waiting on the two year results uh, of the Renexus uh, phase three study, uh, which is looking at uh, implantation of a, um, uh, an, a, a um, sorry, C, it's a CNTF uh, implant, so it's ciliary neurotrophic factor, uh, and certainly was promising in phase two, and really what they're looking at is <clears throat> um, slowing down the rate of loss of tissue uh, in and, and around the fovea from uh, from MACTEL. But obviously it's a it's a long chronic disease uh, and patients' loss of vision tends to be very slow. So a bit like geographic atrophy, it's a long-term follow-up kind of thing. That's 
perfect. Um, so we have another question from Carmen. Can we go through how urgently some of the most common macular diseases need to be referred? So for example, PIC, PED, wet AMD and macular hole. Uh, so uh, pick uh, if, it, uh, if it presents uh, acutely, uh, that, is pretty, um, that is pretty urgent uh, just because of the, um, the risk of, uh, of CNV uh, arising from it. Um, uh, if it's just, if you're just diagnosing it because there's little punched out lesions there and it's just something that you found on imaging, then not urgent. Um, PED is a, uh, is a finding rather than a diagnosis. So PED, uh, the most common reason for seeing that in older people is AMD. And the most common reason in young people is central serous. Um, and so it depends on the company that it's keeping as to the what the urgency is. Uh, wet AMD, I think best practice um, is, to, is for those patients to be seen uh, certainly no longer than a week. Um, now, sometimes, you know, the history will be quite chronic and the vision will be poor and it may not be uh, as critical, but I think that... Um, you, if you're offering the patient to be seen within that uh, space of time, then if they choose otherwise, then that's really um, that's really their responsibility. But that's what I would advise, um, and especially when they've got good starting vision, it's really critical to get them on treatment straight away because they're the ones that can do uh, sensationally well. Uh, macular hole, not um, not in the same category of urgency. And I think within a month um, is fine. Um, it's not, uh, macular holes don't enlarge a great deal in that space of time. Um, obviously, as with any of these things, uh, you know, the patient's um, anxiety or otherwise uh, often dictates that you need to do things a bit differently. And, um, you know, that's, that's the way um, it should be if that's, if that's what the patient uh, prefers, then we just do our best to, to facilitate that. Okay, that's a great overview. Um, we have a question from Steve next. Uh, how often do you use a macular 10 degree visual field to help aid diagnosis? Oh, visual, oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, pretty much the only time that I use a 10 2 um, is as a baseline for patients going on hydroxychloroquine. Um, I really, uh, there'll, there'll be the occasional um, patient where it's not clear from other, from clinical examination and imaging and things, but really um, it's not, um, yeah, it's not something that I use, um, that I use often. Um, multimodal imaging is usually, is usually where it's at. So combination of clinical examination, photography, OCT, autofluorescence, and not as often now, angiography. Okay. Uh, next question. Can dystrophies, example stargards, be easily differentiated from AMD in its early stages? Uh, that is a great question. And um, <clears throat> I think that'll become increasingly important um, with the advent of uh, treatments for geographic atrophy um, because, uh, you know, people with stargarts obviously generally uh, their presentation is early, so around late teens, early 20s, but not always. Um, and there are other manifestations uh, of that genetic mutation that are not typical of stargarts at all. Um, and so, you know, these patients will live to be well and truly in the AMD age group. So it is a really important difference to establish. Um, the, so I'm not, I'll just try to be sure that I'm reading the question correctly. I'm assuming that it means is it differentiated from AMD in its early stages rather than Stargardt's. The, um, so AMD in its early stages is not characterised by things like geographic atrophy, whereas Stargardt's does become atrophic, particularly once the patient's in the AMD age group. 
So epidemiologically, AMD is defined as only happening in patients over 50. Uh, realistically, in their 50s is very uncommon. They're almost all 60s and above. Um, and so it's really the more, uh, it's really the advanced dry form, so the atrophic form of AMD that's going to be confused with these dystrophic processes. Um, there are also uh, other conditions, for example, pattern dystrophy, where the lesions can look like drusen, um, but they actually sit above the RPE rather than below the RPE. So that's a really important distinction to make, and that's where OCT is extremely useful. You've got to be using very high res uh, cuts through the lesions, but that's uh, that's one. The other one that's really really valuable um, with uh, inherited retinal diseases is autofluorescence, um, and that'll be covered in the in the module mirror that you're uh, yep, coordinating absolutely. there. That's a really that's a really key one. So the combination of AF and OCT is going to be the key, not only for inherited retinal disease, but also for uh, assessing geographic atrophy um, in a diagnosis and progress. Okay, uh, a few yeah. more questions yep. that are coming in. So there's um, a question here, is there any preference between five line or HD21 line for AMD? Um, look, it's, I actually do both um, because the uh, 21 lines are nine mil scan and the uh, five lines are six mil scan. I like to get that really, uh, that a bit higher resolution in those central five lines um, with a, in the area around the fovea um, because that's really the most critical uh, area. Um, and the 21 line is really useful, as I said before, for just getting that really large area, but not needing perhaps quite as much. Um, and, and I also do the cube just to be able to quickly eyeball any change and then try to refine it by looking at the, the 21 line. Um, so any trials or treatments for dry AMD that we can refer to? So um, the there are lots and lots and lots um, in stages one, two, three. Uh, so the most advanced one is uh, PEG Cetacoplan, which is the Apelis uh, product, uh, which has just been approved by the TGA. Uh, and they will be submitting uh, to the regulatory people in Australia in the near future. Um, it, it does um, uh, have some effect in slowing down the, the progression of GA, uh, but uh, there's a lot of buts. Uh, they've got to have injections every one to two months uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, there's no sort of treat and extend like Nevascar AMD, so that's just it. They're always going to have it. Um, it significantly increases the chances that they'll get nevascarization, so then they'll need to have anti VEGF injections as well as the GA injections. Uh, and then obviously there's the risk associated with the treatment and all the all the barriers that we currently have with intributorial therapy. So there's a fair road to be gone down there, but there are a lot of other molecules in, uh, uh, in investigation at the moment. Uh, and sorry, how about, I think that must be fundus flavi maculatus. So that's the same genetic mutation as Stargardt disease. Uh, it's just a different phenotype. Um, fundus flavi, uh, in the sort of pure uh, sense, the way it was originally described, um, has the peripheral uh, flex. And again, uh, it's, it's pretty uh, classic on, um, on autofluorescence. Um, but as the genetics of these things, uh, gets worked out. Um, the the more we know, the more questions we come up with, really. Alrighty. Um, I think we have one more through the chat. Uh, what are some examples mm -hmm. when fluorescein angiography is still preferred over OCTA? Yeah, that's a really good question. As I said, OC, OCTA and fluorescein and ICG is good for another time. But essentially, um, OCT angiography is great for 
showing where blood vessels are based on flow, but it cannot show leakage uh, or staining or those other uh, properties related to what happens with the interaction between fluorescein and the tissues. So um, the, the main uh, situations where OCTA is useful, if you've got uh, high flow uh, conditions, so uh, you've got, uh, because the, the whole principle of it is a subtraction, uh, a digital subtraction uh, of what's not moving from all of the rest. So what's left behind is tissue that's moving and that's assumed to be blood. So it's good for looking at fine capillary detail. It's much better than, than uh, fluorescent angiography for that. Uh, and it's good for some forms of uh, CNB that can't be seen with fluorescein. Uh, and it can also image things like um, NBD and NBE and diabetes, etc. cetera. Um, but it's really conditions where you need to be looking at uh, leakage. So some inflammatory conditions, things like retinal vasculitis, uh, a lot of uveitic uh, problems where uh, fluorescent angiography is uh, superior. Um, and also, although there are some machines that can do quite wide angle OCTA, the, the really wide angle uh, fluorescein and ICG with devices like the Optos is the OCTA is not, not in, the, in the hunt there. Um, and last one, what are the main differentials for geographic atrophy compared to other atrophic like macular disease? Uh, so I think the, um, the, the main one is going to be uh, dystrophies. Uh, really, um, in terms of uh, in terms of atrophy, um, there and there's there's a, a bunch of uh, of inherit predominantly inherited conditions, um, and then there's a few a few other rare ones. But really, the the main uh, the main ones are the dystrophies, and uh, obviously, um, you do need to be careful if the patient doesn't have. Uh, any drusen at all, then that's when you really need to be thinking: Am I am I on the right track here? Um, if they've got very severe atrophy, uh, then they may not have any drusen anymore because they may have disappeared. Um, but uh, yeah, really, if the patient's younger than you think they should be for AMD, uh, and they don't have drusen, and/or they don't have drusen, they're the main tip-offs for it being something else. Great, okay. Uh, we have a couple of hands up. I don't know whether these were from your presentation earlier. Um, first hand up is Helen. Yes. Hi Helen, what was your question? I just wanted to know if there's any um, current treatments um, for dry AMG or are there any um experiments going on that we could actually enrol some of our patients, any trials, any clinical trials? Uh, yeah, so definitely um, <clears throat> in terms of clinical trials, um, there's there's a number uh, of them going on. Um, and it's, uh, where are you based, Helen? Um, in Sydney, Eastern Suburbs. Okay. Um, so the probably the best uh, place to contact, um, presuming that your patients are, are in that area would be the Safe Site Institute. Um, that's where a lot of the a lot of the clinical trials are, um, are based. Um, that'd be the best first port of call. Okay, thank you. Um, Michelle, you also have your hand up. Did you have a question? I might come uh, Michelle, back if to Michelle. You're trying to, to, oh, have you, are you the unmuting person, Mira? Because she's still uh, muted. Yeah, I think, is that? No. 
I mute here, maybe that. I might move to Greg. Did you have a question? Michelle, would you be able to type your question in the Q&A box if possible? Otherwise, they may have been hands from before, Alex. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Okay. What I might get the, um, Greg and Michelle, if you do have questions, feel free to email them through and then I can forward them on to Alex to answer um, after, after the session. Alrighty. So thank you so much, Alex, for making time in your Pleasure. very busy Pleasure. schedule to provide what's really been a really educational evening with great insights that I think we've all learned from. For those of you who have found this webinar useful, I encourage you to complete our free and accredited courses through the MDFair website. Many thanks and good night.